Hello everyone and welcome to this short video where I am going to discuss the most common underlying causes to bloating. My name is Alex Manos. I am an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner with a background in nutritional therapy. So I have a master's in personalized nutrition and a degree in nutritional therapy. And I'm also one of the co-founders of Health Path. I'm host of the Health Path podcast. And I guess particularly relevant to today's video on bloating is I have a personal history with small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I got a diagnosis of IBS when I was 18. And for a good chunk of my life, ultimately, I have struggled with digestive issues, bloating, fluctuating between constipation and diarrhea, abdominal pain, brain fog, and these kind of quite common symptoms these days that we kind of put together, cluster them together, and often receive this diagnosis of IBS. But I think it's really important that we dive in and understand that there are underlying imbalances that contribute to these symptoms, and that's empowering. We need to try and understand what is actually contributing to the symptom or symptoms that do get clustered together that lead to that diagnosis. Now, I always feel a little bit uncomfortable doing this, especially at the beginning of a video, but if you enjoy this content, if you find it helpful, we would absolutely love you to click the like button, share it with any relevant people who may be are suffering with bloating, subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our new and additional videos that will be coming on a weekly basis. And leave us a comment, let us know if this video has been helpful, if you would like more around this sort of topic. So the objectives, we're going to provide an overview of the underlying causes and we're going to highlight some of the relevant tests that can help us confirm which of these underlying causes may be relevant for you as a unique individual. Because there's a very common saying, which is treat the individual, not the disease. If we try and support you by focusing on the fact that you have bloating, we can only take somewhat of a generic approach because there are multiple reasons why someone might be experiencing bloating. If we focus on you as an individual, and if we listen to your story, and if as a partnership, we try and understand what's happened throughout your life that might contribute to imbalances that are manifesting as bloating, we can now take a much more personalized approach to supporting you. And that means that we have a much greater chance of success. Now, before we start looking at these underlying imbalances or causes, I do want to just differentiate two terms here because bloating is more of a subjective experience. It's this sensation of trapped or excessive amounts of gas within our digestive system. Whereas distension is actually more objective. It is a measurable increase in the girth around our abdominal area. So sometimes we might be describing ourselves as feeling bloated when actually we have distension. And there are times when we may feel bloated and have absolutely no distension. Bloating being subjective, to some degree can tie in with another common symptom of what they describe as visceral hypersensitivity. And it's a very sort of technical term. All it really means is there's a subset of people with IBS who have heightened sensitivity to what's going on within their guts. And that can lead to this more subjective experience of bloating. And as I say, maybe you have distension, but that doesn't have to be the case. Now these can be overlapping or they can be separate entities. And I thought it might just be useful to separate that. For example, thinking about this practically, some of our customers will say things like, there are times in the day when they just notice that it's harder to um, put their trousers back on after going to the toilet, for example, or they have to um, use a different hole in the belt buckle as the day goes on. That is obviously an indicator that there is distension occurring, whether other times it may just be that they're feeling uncomfortable, that they feel bloated. So 
focusing on this bloating sensation. These are all the things that have been discussed in the research that can contribute to it. So we're not going to go through all of these today because today is going to be focused on imbalances within the digestive system that can contribute to bloating. You can see in this visual here that, for example, sex hormones can actually play a role within bloating. The nervous system can play a role. If we have imbalances within our parasympathetic or sympathetic systems, this is what people refer to as our fight or flight response or our rest and digest response. So essentially, if we are experiencing acute or chronic stress, this can create imbalances in our nervous system, which can then manifest in certain digestive symptoms, basically. The ones we're going to focus on today are the ones with the asterisks next to them. So we're going to be talking about the role that an imbalance in our gut bacteria or our gut microbiome can play. We'll mention how excessive gas accumulation or production can contribute to bloating. We'll mention how the mucosal immune system, if chronically activated, can contribute to this. Your mucosal immune system is essentially a part of the immu immune system that lines the digestive tract. There's this thick layer of mucus that lines the gut, and this is our mucosal immune system. And then food sensitivities or intolerances can also contribute to bloating. And as I say, these are the four that we will focus on today. But I always want to acknowledge the fact that there are other factors that may need to be considered. Today's video is very much gut focused. So with that in mind, what tests can help us understand which of these factors might be at play? Well, we can do comprehensive stool testing to look at our gut microbiome. This will give us an indication um, about whether there could be any imbalances within our bacteria, but it will also give us information around whether there are any imbalances within the yeasts within our large intestine. It will give us an indication of whether there are any parasitic infections that could be contributing to a little bit of bloating. And it will give us some functional markers that I will touch on later in the video that also can confirm whether there's any mucosal immune activation. Remember, that was one of the four things that we're really highlighting today that can cause bloating. You can do a SIBO breath test. That is going to give us an indication of whether there's a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine. And remember that excessive gas production is an underlying factor that can cause bloating. When we have a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, it is incredibly common that we're going to experience bloating as a result because the bacteria there are fermenting some of our foods and that fermentation process creates a lot of gas within our small intestine, which, as you can imagine, will, we may experience as bloating. You can consider food sensitivity or intolerance testing. These are two slightly different tests. Um, I think it's also important to differentiate this. So lactose intolerance is a classic um, intolerance that is quite common. This is when we are lacking sufficient amounts of enzymes to break down that food or sugar. So lactose is the sugar found in dairy products, for example. Lactase is the enzyme that helps break down lactose. If we can't break down lactose sufficiently, it can contribute to gastric symptoms, bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea, for example. Whereas food sensitivities are more of an immunological response. Your immune system is mounting a response, an inappropriate response to a food. And this, it's thought, can be related to imbalances within the microbiome. It can be related to dysfunction within various immune cells. And it can be associated with um, intestinal permeability or this concept of leaky gut. And then I've put the sweet corn test here as well, which is a, a free at home test that Dr. Jason Horolak mentioned in a recent podcast I did with him. He gets clients sometimes to swallow individual um, bits of sweet corn. So you can buy a can rather than corn on the cob. And then rather than chewing it down like we want to do, in the context of this test, you just swallow, you keep them whole, and then you monitor how long it takes for you to actually see, um, to see a cessation 
in sweet corn in the stool. And we want to obviously see that really within um, probably a 24 hour period. Sometimes people are still seeing these whole bits of sweet corn three, four, five, six days afterwards, indicating that they have an issue within the motility, within how long it's taking food to actually travel through the digestive system from mouth to anus. So that is actually a very convenient way of understanding whether there's a transit time issue. Um, so that is um, a, a non-clinical test, shall we say, that can be helpful for some. Now we think of SIBO testing, as mentioned, if you're not yet familiar with this, we do have a separate YouTube video. I'll put a link into um, this video for you in case you want to watch that afterwards. This is a breath test. It is looking to see whether you've got a bacterial overgrowth within the small intestine. But we also look to see whether there could be what we call a methanogen overgrowth. Methanogens are organisms that the vast majority of us have in our guts that produce methane. And methane gas, which is one of the two gases detected within this test, has been quite strongly associated with constipation in the research. And as a result, some people with elevated production of methane often experience bloating as well. So a SIBO breath test is something to consider. Then we have stool testing or microbiome testing, where we can look at various elements of digestive function, the microbiome and this ecosystem of bacteria, parasites and yeasts, as well as um, functional markers as well. So examples here show us that we can look at microbiome diversity, which is thought to be one of the most important markers around gut health and the microbiome. The more diverse the microbiome, the more resilient the microbiome, and the more resilient the microbiome, the more um, it's able to uh, the more it's able to maintain a healthy state when there are insults such as a course of antibiotics or a period of poor diet, for examples. So resiliency is important, and we get that through diversity. We can look at things like a dysbiosis index. This is literally the number of deviations within your stool results compared to normal. So the higher, the worse, the lower, the better. Now we mentioned in one of our initial slides that mucosal immune activation can cause bloating. Now this may manifest in gut testing with high secretory IgA. You can see this marker in the visual here. Secretory IgA is an antibody. It's produced by immune cells and it has a role to play within maintaining an appropriate immune response, within maintaining an appropriate healthy microbiome. And when this is elevated, it's suggesting that there is an activated immune response to something. That could be that there's an infection within the digestive tract, or maybe there is just some general imbalances within the microbiome that's contributing to an activated immune response. And in certain situations, we might also see the inflammatory marker, calprotectin, elevated. Calprotectin is often discussed in the research as a way to distinguish between IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. So when calprotectin is elevated, we're saying that there's inflammation within the large intestine, and that really comes with an activated mucosal immune system. So we've got a couple of key markers there that can give us some specific information around this element of bloating. It's also worth highlighting that the test looks at pancreatic elastase. This is really telling us, are you producing enough digestive enzymes from your pancreas? If you're not, then that could contribute to some maldigestion and malabsorption, and that could certainly contribute to some bloating as well. So I really ummed and ahed around whether to include some sort of general interventions around bloating, because obviously we want to help. We don't want to just it to be theory. However, I decided against this, and the reason being is interventions need to focus on the underlying mechanism or the, the imbalance that is causing the bloating. 
we don't know what that is for you. And we want to empower you. We want you to understand what's going on. And in that situation, sometimes testing can be really helpful. If I were to make some generic interventions, maybe certain supplements or changes to diet, it's a little bit of a try and hope approach. It's saying you can try this and we're kind of hoping that it will work for you, but we're just not sure because we don't know what is causing your bloating in your unique case. So I actually decided not to give you kind of any generic interventions. And I hope you understand why that is. Um, it's really along this line that we want to make sure that what you're trying is the most sensible thing to try because we've been there ourselves. I've worked with clients for 14 years now. I know what it's like when we get to this point where we're trying one thing, we're then trying another thing and we kind of lose faith and we get lost because there's no structure to the process that we're going down. There's no structure to the program. And that's what I really want to help you achieve. So if we can start to understand some of those underlying imbalances, we can be more precise with what interventions might work. What dietary factors do we want to consider? Uh, what supplements might be helpful in the short term that supplement the rest of your program? And what lifestyle factors might be needed to be considered? And again, that's going to be partly dependent on what your lifestyle is like at this point in time. How able are you to make changes to this? So to learn more about us, you can head over to our website, healthpath.com. You can book in a free consultation with one of our team via the URL link here. And you can join our webinars. I do a bi-monthly webinar where you're able to sign up, submit a question, and I will get through as many of the questions as possible um, in a 60-minute Zoom webinar. To sign up to the newsletter, just head over to our website and you will see a button there to sign up. And then finally, if you found this help helpful, let us know, like the video, leave us a comment, subscribe to our channel and share as much as you can. So thank you everyone. As I say, I hope that has been helpful. Uh, and if we can be of any help, let us know.